Good morning once again. Good morning. Can I be carried with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3? Those of you who are new with us, we have been looking at 1 Samuel on Sunday mornings at Calvary, and we're in a series that we've entitled The Importance of Godly Leadership. Because whether you know it or not, as you read the book of 1 Samuel, and actually 2 Samuel too, the issue really that is at the core of these two books is the issue of leadership. Uh, as leaders go, so goes a nation. And at this time, the nation of Israel was suffering a breakdown. A breakdown morally and spiritually because of a lack of godly leadership, really. And uh, the political leaders called judges were corrupt. The uh, spiritual leaders, priests and prophets, were corrupt. But God in His mercy wanted to bring revival to the nation. And so He purposed to raise up a new leader. Someone who would be a judge, prophet, and priest to the nation. And uh, someone He could use then to lay the groundwork for revival. Of course, that man's name was Samuel. Now, uh, as we have been looking at this section in chapter 3... Um, we see that God outlines for us some principles with regard to ministry. Uh, we're all called to be a minister. Some of us get to be pastors, but there's all kinds of things that God's people do in ministry to serve Him. And these principles that we're going to look at that God used in Samuel's life to prepare him for a greater work of ministry for him, uh, we can adapt and apply into our lives. That's the, that's the whole idea, guys, okay? And as we look at how God prepared Samuel, the first thing he did was to give him godly parents. Now listen, to have godly parents is not mandatory to be used by God, but it sure helps, okay? It sure helps. I mean, I was, I was not raised by godly parents, I was raised by good parents. My mom and dad worked hard, we had a great home environment that we grew up in, but they weren't Christians. I often wonder if they had been Christians and started to train me in the Lord right away, how much sooner I could have gotten going with my ministry for the Lord. So, you know, Samuel, or Sam, yes, yeah, Sam, I could call him Samson first. We'll get to Samson eventually. Uh, no, no, he wasn't Samson, okay? But Samuel had the advantage of having godly parents who actually dedicated him to the Lord before he was even born. Now, we talked about this last week. Let me review a little bit. Um, first, Preparation for ministry, if you have the grace of God to have it, is to have godly parents. And uh, Samuel's parents, Elkanah and Hannah, dedicated their son to the Lord, as I said, before he was even born. Now, in their case, they physically gave him up for adoption to be raised by Eli, the high priest, in the tabernacle of the house of God. Now, that was radical. He said, yeah, advanced. to give your son up for adoption uh, so that he could be used by the Lord, that's pretty radical. Yes, it was, but... Uh, those were radical times. There were some really radical problems back then. Radical problems require radical solutions, all right? The days of being a wishy-washy Christian and being used by God in our culture are over. Either you're going to be sold off for the Lord and be used by Him, or you're just not going to make it. it, it it's the, the culture we're living in is demanding us to choose. And uh, that's fine with me. Because we want Christians who have, like Joshua, you know, have chosen this day who we're going to serve. As he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We need that kind of commitment today. But um, they dedicated their son to the Lord when he was just a baby, after he was weaned, about three years old. And then his mother kept encouraging her son in his service for the Lord. We read how that every year that when they came up, and Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina, they would come up with their children to Shiloh, where, where the tabernacle was, every year for this Levitical feast, kind of like a Thanksgiving in our culture, but they all got together, okay, and had a feast before the Lord to thank him, no doubt, for all he had done, and, and worship him. And every year when Hannah came up for this Le Le Levitical feast, she had made her son a set of new clothes, because he was growing. So she made him a little robe and an ephod, a vest. Well, you know, that's what the big priests wore, and the prophets, okay? So by keep by continuing to give him the clothes of a priest and prophet, she was encouraging him in his ministry for the Lord. All right? And, and that's how she did it. And um, because she laid a, a good, solid foundation in Samuel's life right away, by, by dedicating him to the Lord and then encouraging him in his, in his ministry for the Lord, well, guess what? It stuck with him. 
And Samuel went on to wear the robe of a prophet for the rest of his life. The tone you set for your children's life when they're young often will carry them through the rest of their lives. So it's very important, okay? There are many Christian parents, as we said last time, that don't encourage their children to be serious in their service for the Lord at a young age. I guess the mindset is, you know, they're a kid. What are they going to really do to serve God? Look, let me tell you this. God has often used young people to speak to and through. Let me give you an example. On September 7th, 2001, a second grade teacher at the Calvary Chapel Elementary School in Finger Lakes, New York, gave the class an assignment. He told these seven-year-olds to draw a picture, anything they wanted, because they were going to hang them on the walls of the classroom. Well, you know, most of the kids drew things like uh, horses and rainbows and crosses and pictures of Jesus, the typical things that seven-year-old Christian kids would draw. All except for one boy who drew two tall buildings with planes crashing into them. The buildings were on fire and smoke coming out of them. And there were people in the air that had jumped out of the buildings. When the teacher asked the boy about it, he said, every time I went to draw, I couldn't get that picture out of my mind. The picture was so disturbing that the teacher wondered if they needed to send this boy for some counseling. As this was a very strange thing for a little, little boy to draw, very dark. Well, five days later, when the attacks happened on the Twin Towers in New York City, Scott, the pastor, got that picture and looked at it again in shock. He realized that God had spoken to that little boy to tell him what was about to happen. Today, that picture hangs in the sanctuary at Calvary of Philly as a reminder to everyone that God often will speak to children. He will often speak to children about what he is going to do. And we better not discount their little lives as being no big deal. God can't really use them. Because God has shown through this story and many others like it, that he will often use little ones to communicate to and then through. And so we had better take their walk seriously. Starting right here in 1 Samuel 3, God is going to begin to change a nation with a 12-year-old boy. A 12-year-old boy who is about ready to use to change the nation. And so Samuel's preparation for ministry, and we've seen he was already in ministry at the time he was just a small little guy. But the idea here is his preparation for a greater ministry for the Lord began with being blessed with godly parents. But it also then continued through Samuel's faithfulness. We read in verse 1, and the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Now, Josephus, the uh, historian, Jewish historian, tells us that Samuel was uh, about 12 years of old, uh, 12 years of age at this time. Which means there's about a 10-year gap between the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. What has Samuel been doing for all those silent years? Well, it's obvious he has been serving the Lord faithfully all of that time, laboring in relative obscurity. His ministry consisted of, no doubt, menial tasks around the tabernacle, the house of God, cleaning it up, uh, opening the doors of the tabernacle in the morning so people could come and worship the Lord, closing them at night, no doubt helping the priests around the area of the tabernacle with little ministry responsibilities that he had. I'm sure it was nothing that grand or important, but he was faithful in the little things. Listen, here's a great principle for ministry. If you want God to use you in greater ways for His glory, listen, you must be faithful in the little things and please Him in private because then He will eventually lift you into greater areas of ministry. <laughs> David said in Psalm 101, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing unclean before my eyes. Guys, what we are in private is what we really are. We can all come to church and put on the facade. We're good at that. But God sees the heart. God is there with us in the private moments. And if we understand that, if we live our lives to honor Him when we're in private, guess what? He will honor us in public by lifting us up and using us for ministry. The third principle I see that comes out of this, this passage is, look, you be diligent when God is silent. We just saw how you know Samuel continued through faithful service 
uh, when, when he was serving in obscurity. Okay? But listen, number three, you be diligent when God is silent. It says at the end of verse 1, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. In other words, God wasn't speaking much in those days. Nothing exciting was going on. Why? Well, I'm convinced it wasn't that God didn't want to speak. It was just that he knew people didn't want to hear it. Now, sometimes God will talk even if we don't want to hear it. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But as a nation, if a nation shuts their heart to God, well, as, God, as David told his son uh, Solomon, if you, if you pursue the Lord, he'll be found by you. If you forsake him, he'll forsake you. If a nation pursues God, God will speak to that nation. He will keep it on the right track. If a nation turns its back on God, God will turn his back on that nation. I think God wanted to speak. In fact, he was about to speak through a young boy. But for the most part, God had been silent. Why? Because people didn't want to hear it. This opened up during the period of the judges, First Samuel does. Read the book of Judges five, six, seven times. God lays out what was going on in those days. Why it was so bad, so dark. Everyone did. There was no king in Israel. So everyone did whatever seemed right in their own <coughs> eyes. Everyone did whatever seemed right. There, there was no absolute truth. It was all relative. Hey, what's your truth? Is your truth? My truth is my truth. Do you think it's okay? It's okay. I'm not going to lay a trip on you. Don't lay a trip on me. Let's just do whatever we think is right. It's not that they didn't have God's word. It's not that they didn't know it was right. God had given his law through Moses. It was reaffirmed through Joshua, two godly men. The people knew what was right. The people knew what God had said. But they just didn't care. They wanted to do their own thing. And those were the days Samuel was ministering in. These were dark and difficult days, not days of revival and encouragement. Look, when God is moving, everybody wants to be in God's house. When, God, when, when the Holy Spirit was moving in the 60s during the, during the Jesus movement, kids came from all over to get connected because God was moving. It was exciting. But when the Spirit of God began to withdraw, the excitement and all the, wow, stuff going on, and people had to settle into walking with God, not because they got a high but just because now they wanted to love the Lord and walk with Him, a lot of those kids peeled off. Went back to their old lives. They weren't real. But those kids that stayed and grew up in the church, and they stayed because they loved Jesus and just wanted to serve Him no matter how hard it was, today many of them are missionaries and pastors and so on. Look, Samuel did not minister in days of great revival and excitement. Again, these were days of spiritual apathy and moral decline. And those that did come to the house of God to worship, and, and by the way, even, in, even during some of Israel's worst times spiritually, they still went to the temple. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. God says, time out. Stop. Stop bringing me sacrifices. Stop observing the feast days. You're just going through the motions. I don't want religion from you. I want a relationship with you. Your hearts are not for me. I'm tired. Of, I can't stand the singing anymore. It doesn't mean anything. Get your heart right with me. And then we'll go forward together, is the idea. So even though people were coming to the tabernacle to worship God during this time, guess what? Very robotic, very mechanical. People were going through the motions because they thought by just coming to Tabernacle and doing their religious thing, that's all that they needed to do. Then they went home and lived immoral lives. Very immoral period. But this was the day in which Samuel was serving the Lord. And yet, he remained faithful through it all. He remained faithful. Look, too many Christians, as we said last time, only want to serve the Lord for what they can get out of it. The recognition, the thrill, okay? Uh, a greater sense of self-worth, even money. And sadly, a lot of pastors feed into that mindset. How? Well, they reward people with ministries who are the biggest givers. They reward people with ministries so that they don't leave the church. But let me tell you something, guys. Whenever ministry is man-focused and not Christ-centered, you will never produce godly, faithful servants. Because it's always about them. And if you feed into that, you're just, you're just 
perpetuating their, you know, their whole mentality, their whole uh, agenda, which is not really Christ-centered, it's self-centered. What's God, God, what's God going to do for me? Oh, I want to serve ministry. Why? Well, because I want people to see me. I want people to know how spiritual I am. <laughs> I, I want people to, I get a great sense of self-worth when I serve God in ministry. Great. That's not why we serve God in ministry. It's not about us. It's about Him. And it's those people that serve God just out of a look for Jesus. Not for what they're going to get out of it or what God's going to give them. If they just, if the people that just remain faithful to the call of God upon their lives and serve Him with a loyal heart and a willing mind, well, they're the ones that God will use in greater ways for His glory. And that really brings us to the fourth principle I see here and how God prepares us for ministry. Preparation takes time. So be patient and wait for God to open the door for ministry. Preparation takes time. Verse 2. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow dim, so dim that he could not see, and, there, uh, and before the Lamb of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. We read that God first spoke to Samuel before the Lamb of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord. Now, this lamp was called a menorah. It was a seven-branched oil-burning lamp. And on top of each of the seven stems, there was a bowl with a wick in it, and they would put oil in it. The idea was that God said, when you, lit, when you light the menorah, it's always going to remain on. It's supposed to be a perpetual light. It represents Christ. And Jesus is the light of the world. He never goes out. Okay. So, you know, they wanted to keep it going. That was what God said. <coughs> And so it was the responsibility of the priest that early in the morning, after the sun had come up, they would fill the bowls with oil. It would last until around sundown. And at sundown, they would fill the bowls again with oil. And then this is how they would do it, to keep the light burning. So when it says that God first spoke to Samuel before the lamp went out, it means it was still very early in the morning before the sun had come up. Maybe 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. That the Lord called Samuel. Of course, this was literal, and that the Lord, I believe, audibly spoke to Samuel, as we're going to see, all right? But figuratively, this was the Lord's call of Samuel into the ministry, as a prophet, a priest, and a judge in Israel. Verse 4, But the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. So he ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for you called me. Eli said, I did not call you. Lie down. He went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Eli answered, I didn't call you my son. Go lay down for me. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Interesting statement. Here Samuel was serving the Lord in the house of God, but he didn't yet know the Lord. He wasn't saved yet. This is like so many children that have grown up in Christian homes and even served the Lord in church in some way and yet aren't saved yet. But listen, this is my conviction, okay? So you take it if you want it, forget it, or whatever. I believe, it's my conviction, if Christian parents are faithful to diligently teach their kids about the Lord from a young age, if they exemplify for them a good witness and that the parents love the Lord, it's obvious, and they, they are upright people and, certain, and have a sincere love for God, and they get the kids involved in church early, in some way. You're a Sunday school teacher, bring them to help you set up the Sunday school room. Uh, we go to the homeless shelter, bring them so they can help pass out stuff, so that from a young age they get used to the idea that, look, life is about others, not me. It's about serving Jesus, not serving myself. And then you pray diligently, fervently for them. I believe at one point God will reveal himself to them and they will come to know. I mean, Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, the Hebrew says, when he gets whiskers, 
you will not depart from it. The worst thing a parent can do is say, and I've never heard a Christian parent say this, although I have heard some secular parents say it. I hope a Christian parent would never say this. But the worst thing a parent can do is say, well, I'm going to let them grow up and then decide for themselves what they want to believe when they get to be adults. Why do you think God has given kids to parents? Because it's our responsibility to train them. I told a mom who told me this one time, I was going to let them grow up and decide what they want to do what they want to believe. I said, do you do that with nutrition? Do you let them eat whatever they want now and then grow up and decide later what, you know, mm -hmm. what, you know do, you, do, you, do you use that uh, with morality? Do you let them do whatever they want now and then when they get old they can decide what morals they want to obey or not obey? Mm -hmm. It's foolishness. It's laziness. It's a cop-out. Those kids need us to train them. That's why God has given them to us. And by the way, as we said last week, they're on loan. They don't belong to us. And we're going to have to present them back to the Lord someday and give an account as to how good a job we did in training them in the ways of God, in the Word of God, and so on. Hannah and Elkanah trained Samuel. They only had him the first three years until he was weaned. Then he gave him to Eli and they prayed for him, no doubt, all the time. And his mom kept encouraging him in his ministry every year by bringing him the role to the best, as we talked about. Look, they dedicated their son to the Lord at an early age and let him grow up in church, quote-unquote. Serving the Lord. And at one point, God used that. He revealed himself to Samuel, and Samuel got saved and called by God into a great ministry for the Lord, even as I believe will be the same thing for our kids. You say, but how does this principle apply to all of us? How does it apply? Well, again, the principle is Preparation takes time. So be patient and wait for God to open the door for ministry. Look, during those faithful years of service, when God hasn't told you to do anything else for Him, keep doing what He's already told you to do. But we talked about that last time, right? If God hasn't given you any new ministry to do, keep working with the old ministry. And do it faithfully. And hang in there, because guess what? God is using that time to prepare you. You say, but I'm not doing much for the Lord. I'm just, you know, uh, setting up chairs, or I'm working in the sound ministry, or I'm working uh, teaching a Sunday school class. First of all, those are not little ministries. Nothing, no ministry is little in the eyes of God. But if we are faithful in what we consider the smaller things, God using them to teach us responsibility and being faithful, at one point He will lift us up to do greater things for Him. The point I'm making is it takes time. It takes time for God to prepare the instruments He wants to use. Don't get discouraged. Don't quit. Because guess what? When God finally does break His silence and open a door for a ministry, another ministry, hang on. Things are going to start moving quick. You have to be prepared. I think of Joseph. Okay, remember Joseph? Uh, the second youngest of Jacob's sons. And Jacob loved Joseph and favored him, which wasn't good. It caused his older brothers to resent him. In fact, they resented him so much that one day they made a trap for him and they sold him into slavery <coughs> where he wound up working for 10 years in the house of Potiphar, who was an Egyptian uh, commander for Pharaoh, uh, going a lot on the affairs of state. And, uh, but Joseph was there and he worked hard for Potiphar. God's hand was upon Joseph. Potiphar saw that everything this kid touched, he was only about 17 uh, at the time when he first got sold into slavery, everything he touched God prospered. So Potiphar made him the head steward over all his household. Now look, I've often thought about this. I can't believe a young, healthy guy couldn't have escaped from Potiphar's house during those 10 years. Why did he do that? Why, why did he stay? Because he obviously had a high view of God's sovereignty and realized God has got me here for a reason. And I'm going to learn whatever it is God has. It's not fair. I don't belong here. I'm a free man. I'm not a slave. But my God's in control. And if God has allowed this to happen, He must have a purpose in it. He must be wanting to prepare me through it somehow. He served Potiphar faithfully ten years. Then Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of trying to rape her. It was a lie. So now he finds himself in prison, the dungeon. And there again he works hard for the jailer, and the jailer sees everything that's been touches, God blesses. So he makes him head over all the other prisoners. Three years is in that jail. Thirteen years, and I've often wondered what was going through Joseph's mind. Every time he tries to be faithful, he gets knocked down a little lower. 
I'm wondering if Joseph ever thought he doesn't pay to serve God. I don't think so. I think he was a pretty mature kid. I would probably say that, but that, that I'm not Joseph. <laughs> but you remember the story. At one point, Joseph had an opportunity to, to interpret a couple of dreams for a couple of prisoners. One didn't work out so well, you're going to be killed in three days. Other one said, you're going to be released in three days and restored back to Pharaoh as his uh, cupbearer, I think it was, cupbearer. That happened, and the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph. Another year passes, three years total. Pharaoh was a couple dreams. Nobody can interpret them. The cupbearer says, man, I blew it. I, there's a guy in prison. I told him I was going to put a word in for him. I, you know, Because he interpreted a dream for me. It worked out real well. It's like he told me. I forgot. You know. It was a God-given amnesia. Time wasn't right there. And so Pharaoh calls for Joseph. They clean him up, of course. Stands before Pharaoh. Interprets the dreams. Pharaoh says, there's nobody like this guy in all my kingdom. You know what? You're my prime minister. In one day. In one day. Thirteen years in one day. He goes from prisoner to prime minister. My point is when God starts to work, hold on to your seat. He moves quick. And you need to be prepared. Because if you're not, then he'll pass over you and call somebody else. Use this time to know the scriptures, to know your God, to serve him faithfully. Because when God opens the door, hold on to your seatbelts. Things are going to move quick, okay? And uh, we all want God to use us in greater ways, I believe. I'd like to think that as Christians. But be careful not to let your zeal cause you to rush the timing of God and get into a ministry he hasn't called you to or hasn't called you to yet. That will be a disaster. You've got to wait for God's timing. I think of Moses. Moses grew up in Pharaoh's house, and Moses knew, we knew, learned this in the New Testament, he knew God had him there for a reason to be a deliverer. Because the children of Israel were in slavery at this time. So what did Moses do? He rushed the timing of God, so I'm going to be, God's calling me to be a deliverer, here we go. God says, oh no, we don't. <coughs> uh, you know, we don't do it on your timetable, well, we do it on my timetable. <laughs> and so that caused Moses to have to flee, he had to leave Egypt. For the next 40 years, he he uh, wandered in the desert uh, with, as a shepherd. But even that, God was using him and teaching him. He had to prepare him to be a shepherd. When God wanted a king, he went to the shepherds. When Israel wanted a king, they went to the tall, dark, and handsome. That's always a disaster, by the way. They got Saul. And that was a disaster, and God says, Okay, now you ready for my king? Samuel, go to the house of Jesse. I'm getting ahead of the story, obviously. I've got a guy there, I want you to anoint his king. First kid comes out, Elliot looks good, man, good looking kid. And Samuel goes, This has got to be a good one. The Lord spoke to Samuel and says, Samuel, don't look at his height, stature, okay? I don't look at the outward like you do. I'm looking at the heart. And eventually, this little ruddy 14, 15 year old kid comes walking out. And God says, This is the guy. This is the guy. <laughs> Samuel, I choose people to serve me not on the basis of what they are, but on the basis of what they can become as they walk with me. That's where that preparation comes in, guys. And David was anointed king. Why? Because God wanted a shepherd. A man who was a shepherd, who had a heart for sheep, would be a great leader of his people. And that's what God was working in Moses' life. And eventually when God did call him, he was prepared. He was prepared. Look, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, For everything there is a season, a time, for every purpose under heaven. Seek God's timetable, not your own. And so God had prepared, been preparing Samuel for years for, the, for his ministry as prophet to the nation. And now the time had come to use him. Someone has said, God is never in a hurry when preparing someone for a work. And the greater the work, the longer he takes to prepare them. So verse 7 once again, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. There are many Christians who would confess that they have never heard God speak to them personally. Now, of course, he speaks to his word, and they know that. But they would confess they have never heard God speak to their heart personally about what he wants for them individually, for their personal life. They say things like, well, God doesn't talk to me. I don't believe that. It's not that God isn't speaking. It's often we're not what? listening remember how God spoke to Elijah he spoke to him in a still small voice why do you think God spoke to Samuel 
in the middle of the night? Because it's in the middle of the night that there's more, most quietness around us. Okay? In the middle of the night. Why does God often speak to us in the middle of the night? And, and you know what? I'm convinced he's spoken to many of us in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, we just kind of roll over sometimes and go back to sleep. If God speaks to you, if God wakes you up and impresses something on your heart he wants to talk to you about, what did Samuel do? He got up. He got up, verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. Then he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you didn't call me. Then Eli perceived, Well, oh, the Lord must be talking to this kid. <laughs> All right. He said, uh, in verse 9 to Samuel, he said, Look, go lie down. And it shall be if he calls you that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. And I believe God has spoken to him audibly. And I believe God came to him in a vision, as we're going to see. So that Samuel actually saw the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen with all of us, obviously. But I'm convinced many a night God has stood by our beds invisibly and spoken to our hearts and we've just ignored it. You know what? We must do as Samuel did. We must get up and respond by saying, Lord, I think you're speaking to me. Let me get up. Let me get my Bible. Let me get along with you. Because I want to hear what you have to say. If God is speaking to your heart, listen. Who knows? He may be about to call you into an incredible ministry for his glory. And that brings us to the fifth principle. When God speaks, be ready to obey. When God speaks, be ready to obey. The problem with all too many Christians is not that they don't know what the Lord has told them to do. It's not, they're just not doing it. You ask him, well, has God spoken to you? Yes, he spoke to me about doing this ministry or that ministry. Well, how's it going? Why haven't I actually started yet? Well, why not? I'm waiting for confirmation. Well, how long has it been? Five years? Uh, I think now he's waiting on you. Okay? I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God. Well, yeah, after about five years, I would think that God's waiting on you now. Look, confirmation is great. I encourage you to seek confirmation if you feel God's telling you to get into a pretty incredible ministry. But sometimes we're looking for confirmation because we really don't want to do it. We're scared. It means making a dramatic change in my life, and I'm not ready to do that. So we want to sound all spiritual. We say, well, I'm waiting for confirmation. God's saying, you know, you're on the shelf there, buddy. I mean, you know, you're waiting for confirmation. I got you on the shelf. I'm going to other people. You want to jump down off the shelf and, you know, here I am, Lord, use me, I'll use you. Look, James says, don't be hearers of the word only, but be doers. Sometimes we come to church and we think, well, we've heard the word of God. That's all I need. God says, no, that's not a, an end of itself. It's a means of an end. The means is obedience. You hear the word of God, so you can obey. That's the idea. What has God told you to do? Has God spoken to your heart about anything that he wants you to do? And what are you doing about it, is the idea, right? Well, verse 11, Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel in which both ears of everyone who hears it will, what? Tingle. Huh. That's not the tingle of excitement. Okay, that's a term of judgment in Scripture. It's like when you take your hands, okay, and you will, bam, on somebody's head, slapping them in the ears. And their ears tingle and ring. God says, I'm about to slap Israel upside the head. Because they're not obeying me. They're not listening to me. And I'm about ready to bring judgment upon the nation. He said, wait a minute. You just said Samuel was called to be used by God to bring revival. That's right, guys. Often judgment is a precursor to revival. Sometimes if a nation becomes so dull of hearing, so hard-hearted... God has to really do something pretty severe to get their attention. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers in our pleasures, but shouts in our pain. You don't think 9-11 was a shout? Apparently it wasn't loud enough. As I heard the first Sunday after 9-11, churches were full. That didn't last too long. Our leaders on the steps of the Capitol saying, God bless America, kumbaya, whatever they were saying up there. <laughs> but you know what? It was just emptiness. And God knows that. Sometimes, as God said in Isaiah 19, sometimes I have to hurt to heal. God loves America. God loves America. 
And I believe, and I hope I'm wrong, I believe judgment is coming. Now, one of the prophets said, in judgment, remember mercy. And I believe God only brings judgment at first to get our attention. Because he's merciful and wants us to repent. God loves America. He wants this country to really live out its motto, in God we trust. One nation under God. He doesn't want that to be a slogan. He wants that to be a description of our lives. He's really number one. We live for him. Well, verse 12, in that day, God said, I will perform against Eli. In all that I have spoken, I will perform against Eli, all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows. Because his sons made themselves vile, he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or by offering forever. In other words, the day of grace will come to an end. God had given Eli and his family time to repent. They refused to repent. God says, now it doesn't matter. If you offer sacrifices or whatever, I'm not going to listen anymore. There is a time when God extends grace. But if we harden our hearts, that time will come and go, and then God will bring judgment. Verse 15, so Samuel laid down until morning, opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he answered, here am I. He said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please, do not hide it from me. God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. Well, no pressure there, okay. <laughs> then Samuel told him everything. Underline that. He told him everything, and hid nothing from him. And he said, it, Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. The very first prophetic words that God gave to Samuel was to pronounce judgment upon the man who had raised him and on Eli's family. And you know, I, guys, I can only imagine how difficult that must have been for this young servant of God to obey God. God was revealing himself to a word to Samuel because he was basically calling him into the ministry of a prophet. Samuel had two choices at that moment. Yes, I will obey you, Lord, or no, I reject what you're asking me to do. That's why I say this principle, when God speaks, you're ready to what? <coughs> Obey. Obey. I think sometimes God lets us languish for years, struggling in our walk with Him, struggling in our ministry for Him, because He's wanting us to be hungry. He's wanting us to be thirsty. So when He does reveal Himself to us in a new way, we're ready to go. We're, we want to obey. Remember what God said? I will pour my Spirit out on Him who is thirsty, like water upon the dry ground. I would imagine this was very difficult for Samuel to obey what God was calling him to. But he had been prepared. He loved God. He was ready. The sixth principle I see here is this. If you want God to use you, you must declare all that he has said in his word and hold nothing back no matter how hard it will be for people to hear it. Very important. He told Eli everything, even though it was painful. He loved Eli. He told him everything God had spoken to him about. Paul said to the Ephesian elders, I have not shown to declare to you the whole counsel of God. If you want to be used by God, guys, we must be God-pleasers, not man-pleasers. We must be God-pleasers, not man-pleasers. Paul was a God-pleaser. He took a lot of heat for the things that he revealed to people, things that God told him. At one point he said, have I, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Well, sadly, yes. For many people, they don't want to hear the truth. And when you tell them what God has spoken to you about them, they get very upset. They want to make you the fall of God. They want to turn on you. But you know what? In ministry, if we're going to be used by God, we have to obey God and declare everything he has said, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. And look, it isn't easy. It's not always easy to speak God's truth into a person's life. Because we love them. We know it's going to possibly damage our relationship with them. But if you really love them, and God is trying to correct them so you can begin to bless them again, you're going to speak into their hearts, into their lives. God's truth. Now, 
The seventh principle I see is this for ministry. If you stay close to God and faithful to declare everything He has said, you will have a tremendous impact on people's lives. Verse 19 of 1 Samuel 3. So Samuel what? Grew. Yeah, he grew physically, obviously. But he grew spiritually. He grew in his walk with the Lord. And the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, everything Samuel had said was from God was from God, and God brought it to pass. Everyone knew that God was speaking to Samuel, because nothing failed of all that he said. Remember what Paul said in Acts 20, verse 28? Again, to the same Ephesian elders, he said, Take heed to yourselves and all the flock of God. But take heed, you elders. Take heed to yourselves. What does that mean? It means our greatest ministry, guys, listen, our greatest ministry is not to others, it's to us. Our greatest ministry is <coughs> to us. You're not, excuse me, if you're not growing, don't expect to help others grow. You can't give what you don't have. I mean, you can't tell others how good God is if you haven't first tasted and seen his goodness for yourself. That means drawing close to him and walking with him. Remember what Jesus said? The farmer has to be the first one to eat the crops. Why? Because that's the only way he's going to be strong enough to feed everybody else. As a pastor, and people that don't understand this principle, they hear me say this, my main ministry is to me, they think it's selfish. No, that's essential. Because if I'm not working on my walk with God, if I'm not drawing close to him, what benefit am I going to be to you guys? Hey, you know, it's all about... <laughs> It's all about me. It's, but, but in ministry, if I'm going to bless somebody else, I've got to be walking with God, right? A young preacher came to the great Spurgeon one day and said, what is the secret of getting people to come to church and building a powerful ministry for the Lord? You know what Spurgeon told him? You go home and get along with God. You stay with God until God sets you on fire, then people will come to church to watch you burn. <laughs> Simple as that. Simple as that. Okay? Look. I think people can see it funny. Someone who comes across real spiritual, but their lives don't really reflect it. But somebody who loves God, knows God, and is on fire for God, when they get up to speak for God, man, people say, I don't know what he's got or she's got, but I want it. They know God. And I want what they have. I want it. I'm going to come to church just to learn what they have, because I want that. They'll come to watch you burn. Okay? Okay. Number eight, I'll give you, two, uh, give you two real quick. Two more. Another principle for ministry. The result was, in Samuel's life, it applies to all of us, the result was that God established Samuel in a far greater way than Samuel could have ever established himself. Verse 20, And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, in other words, from the extreme north all the way to the south, knew that Samuel had been, listen, established as a prophet of the Lord. They knew that. Okay, because Samuel walked with God, and uh, God eventually established him in a way in ministry that he could never have established himself in. Remember what Jesus said in uh, Matthew 23 to the, to the uh, Pharisees? He said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself or herself will be exalted. If we walk before our God with a pure heart and a humble heart, we, 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 we don't do it to, to be seen by people. We just do it because we love God when we're known. Guess what? He will establish us. He will lift us up. And it won't be something we're doing. We're just loving the Lord. And He will be working through us. I'll give you one more. Number nine. As long as you remain humble and teachable, God will keep speaking to you to, to, to direct and use your life for His glory. Verse 21. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So Samuel continued to walk with God. He remained humble. He remained teachable. And God kept revealing himself to Samuel. And Samuel kept growing. And God kept using him. A very important principle. Let me just finish by saying this. In fact, turn to 1 John 2. I'm going to give you, right now, the greatest principle of ministry you'll find anywhere in Scripture. The greatest principle for ministry. The greatest... I don't know. 
just the greatest um, way a person can be used in ministry. This is it right here. Here's what John said. 1 John 2, starting in verse 26. He said, These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. There's a lot of deceivers out there. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, uh, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Remember what Jesus said before he went to the cross the night before in the upper room? He said, I have many things I want to tell you guys, talking to his disciples. You're not ready to handle it yet. But the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He will teach you all things. He will teach you. He will equip you for ministry. Guys, we don't need a degree to serve God. Some of the greatest pastors and preachers in the history of the church never went to seminary or Bible college. But God called them, and as the Bible says, whom the Lord calls, he what? He equips. I almost didn't get into ministry because I didn't have a degree. I thought, hey, I'm going to... A doctor can't be a doctor without a degree. A lawyer can't be a lawyer without a degree. Why, why do I think I can be a pastor without a degree? And God used my pastor to teach me that if the Lord calls you to go to Bible college and seminary, do it. If he calls you into ministry without those things, he will equip you. John says you have an anointing. That anointing comes from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from a, a degree on a piece of paper. You receive a degree on a piece of paper from a Bible college that says you're now, you know, what? You're now anointed? <laughs> no, it says we now appoint you to ministry. God says, well, great. But unless I anoint them for the ministry, it doesn't mean anything. Look, don't be intimidated by all these people who have their degrees and say to you, well, you can't serve God. You don't have a degree. Mm -hmm. Um... Remember when Peter and John were preaching in Acts 4? The Holy Spirit had come upon the church. The church was born. Peter went out preaching dynamically after he, God used him to heal a lame guy. Well, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council, didn't like that. They called these two guys in. They cross-examined them, interrogated them. And Peter gave a bold witness. He was filled with the Spirit. It says in Acts 13, verse, chapter 4, verse 13, Now when these big shots... These learned men saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. That just means they didn't have a degree from their universities. They marveled. But they realized they had been with Jesus. Guys, if you take nothing with you today, if you want to be used by God, you hang out with Jesus. You hang out in the Word. You let the Holy Spirit teach you. You wait patiently for the Lord to open a door for ministry. And when he does, be ready because he's going to use you. Whom the Lord calls, he equips. That is the greatest principle for ministry I know. If you hang out with Jesus, you get to know him. You sit at his feet like Mary did, soak, soaking up his word, his wisdom. I guarantee you, you will be more equipped for ministry than some guy with a Ph.D. from Yale Divinity School or, or whatever. I tell you what, you give me a sixth grader who's spiritual, I'll take that person any day over some egghead professor. <laughs> they can write a lot of Greek and Hebrew in their sleep, but don't know the Lord. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop now. Uh, so, so God bless you guys. We just pray the Lord will give us grace to want Him to use us. It's never, can He use me? Yeah. It, he can and will use anybody. It's, am I available? Will I present myself to him and say, Lord, here am I. You send me. May God give us the grace to have that heart. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace. Lord, you don't need any of us. Lord, you don't need any of us to do anything. You're completely self-sufficient. But thank you that you've made us to be productive, and then you've called us into ministry to be productive for your kingdom. And Lord, give us grace to apply these, to meditate on these principles and to apply them to our lives. These are the last days. I know you're, you're moving quickly, Lord. 
There's not much time left. The work is great. The laborers are few. The, we don't have time to be fooling around, stumbling around. Do, Lord, take us by the hand as individuals and as a church. And lead us into the work that you're, where you're working that we can get in there and start serving you. We just thank you, Lord. We just praise you. We ask you to be merciful to America. And bring revival instead of judgment. Although sometimes they go hand in hand. We just praise you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and grace. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.